Sorry about that. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Audrey Stewart, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Sanjana Sathian discussing her debut novel, Gold Diggers. She is joined tonight in conversation by Karan Mahajan. Through virtual times, good and bad, Harvard Bookstore will continue to bring authors and their work to our new virtual community. Our spring season is in full swing and we have an amazing summer plan for you. So make sure to check out our event schedule at harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude for some time for your questions. If you have a question at any time during the talk tonight, go to the Q&A button on your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. If you'd like to purchase a copy of Gold Diggers, there will be a link in the chat where you can purchase. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you. There will also be a link in the uh, chat for donation if you'd like to give additional support to Harvard Bookstore. Without your continued support and patronage, this virtual author series wouldn't be possible. Thank you for tuning in in support of our authors, our incredible booksellers, and our landmark independent bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And as you may have experienced in per virtual gatherings this past year and change, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as we can. Thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. Now, I am so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Sanjana Sathian is a Paul and Daisy Soros Fellow and a 2019 graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop. She has worked as a reporter in Mumbai and San Francisco with nonfiction bylines for The New Yorker, The New York Times, Food and Wine, The Boston Globe, The San Francisco Chronicle, and more. Her award-winning short fiction has been published in Boulevard, Joyland, Salt Hill, and The Master's Review. She is joined tonight by Karan Mahajan. Karan is the author of Family Planning, which was shortlisted for the National Book Award and was named one of the New York Times Book Review's 10 Best Books of 2016. In 2017, he was selected as one of Granta's Best Young American Novelists. His reporting and criticism has appeared in the New York Times, Vanity Fair, The New Republic, The New Yorker Online, and more. Tonight, they are discussing the novel Gold Diggers. This beautiful, funny, heartfelt novel takes a look at what Americans of color must do in, to make their way in this world. Sanjana's breakthrough novel is a folk tale, a heist novel, a family story, and a tale of friendship all in one. As far as I have seen, there is not one bad review of this book, and there are quite a lot of reviews. I'll leave you tonight with this quote from Ron Charles of the Washington Post. Looking up from the pages of the sparkling debut, I experienced something like the thrill of the luckiest 49ers must have felt. Gold, gold, gold. And on that shining note of praise, I'll turn things over to our authors. Sanjana Karan, thank you so much for being here tonight. The virtual podium is yours. Thanks, Audrey. Um, I'm super excited to be here virtually. Um, I love the Harvard Bookstore. It's one of my favorite independent bookstores. And one of the first short stories I ever published was set in like a wonky Harvard Square in a shop right above the Harvard bookstore. Um, it was about magical earwax. Um, I'm also really excited to be here with Karen, uh, who is really one of my favorite writers. And so I'm fangirling a little that he agreed to do this. So, so thank you both. Um, I'll read for about five minutes and apologies if my voice gives out, it's, it's been going. Um, lots of talking. So um, I'm gonna read from the end of the first chapter. Um, the context that you need here is that the narrator, Neil Narayan, has been to a spring fling dance at the start of the chapter um, with his best friend, Anita, um, and some drama went down. Anita kind of blew him off and his older sister, Prachi, got in some trouble for drinking. At the end of May, my whole family donned our Indian clothes and headed to a big party cel celebrating the Putt twins' graduation. I scratched at the blue kurta my mother had made me wear. Talk on the way there focused on the honorees. Jay was Ivy League bound in the fall, while Mina would attend a state school and not one of the better ones in my parents' eyes. Mina's fate offended my mother. She fooled around all high school, didn't she? My mother said to Prachi. This was the latest tactic in the wake of Prachi's spring fling moral miscarriage. 
my mother would ask her to recite the fates of those who fooled around, which might, in her view, include anything from neglecting to take AP biology to shooting up hard drugs. She educated us about the wider world by assembling a kind of shoebox diorama of other people's lives, a cardboard drama. She ranged the characters, moved them about, and showed you how they were doing it wrong, turning the diorama into the set of a morality play. Upon arriving at the putts, I prepared to abscond to the basement. Basements were the safest place to survive an Indian party in the suburbs. In a basement, the itchy clothes could be loosened, the girls' dupattas dropped on the floor and trampled upon, the guys' kurtas removed to reveal that all along, someone had been smart enough to wear a t-shirt beneath the fabric and jeans rather than churidars below. In basements, you never encountered garish images of multi-armed gods or family portraits shot in the mall photography studio, sisters draped in langas and brothers' hair stiff with gel. In basements, you found foosball and ping pong tables, big screen televisions, and depending on the benevolence of the parents, video game consoles. In basements, I learned the secrets of sex, according to information curated from older brothers who were certainly still virgins. In basements, a semblance of our due, American teenagedom. The Narayan family basement was, by the way, unfinished. Lavish schmavish, my mother whispered as I made for the underground. This was her general opinion on the putts and on any carpeting or televisions below the earth. New graduates kicked back in oversized leather recliners. Mina Putt sat on the lap of George Warner Wilson, who had spent high school as one of the only white people among Asians. He was going to Georgia Tech in the fall, where he might continue dwelling at this demographic crossroads. Nilo, Nilium, Nilius, he said through his sinuses, saluting me. I waved. Your crew's in the exercise room, he pointed. As I opened the door, I heard Mina sigh with a voice less damned per my mother's diorama than insouciant. Can someone bring me something that's not frickin' Indian food? The gym looked unused. Half the walls were mirrors. Folded up against an unmirrored wall was a treadmill draped in plastic. Mounted in one corner, a television, and beneath it, a video game console. A report of gunfire went off on screen. Fuck you, Osama, this is America, yelled Karthik Jane, as Aleem Khan's avatar, a square-jawed white soldier, expired. Anita sat cross-legged on the floor, examining a glossy magazine. She hovered a pencil above the pages, marking off answers in some quiz. Oh, good, Neil. Everyone was wondering where you were she said in that brisk voice of hers. Her eyes alighted on me for only an instant. Anita was a bit like a wind-up toy, capable of spinning fast for a period, laughing easily, tending to social niceties, only to run out later in private. When it was just the two of us, she'd always been slower, laxer. Amnesia, I thought viciously, ignoring me all spring, and now here she was, bending over the magazine so that I spied, the top of her newly grown chest. Now Anita was turning to Aline saying, you got mostly Bs, so your future wife is Lauren Bennett. Giggles from money with the improbability, but really don't take it too seriously. These things are designed for girls. Anita loved these games and quizzes, anything that offered a prognostication, anything to help her better articulate her future, no matter how trite. I understood why, a positive result, you'd marry Melanie Cho could turn you briefly dreamy with a picture of a life to come. The worst result you should land, you could land in one of these divinations, Shruti Patel. Who do you get, Anita? I said. Jake Gyllenhaal, she smirked. Doesn't count. That's what I said, Isha Aurora put in. No celebrities. Whatever, Anita said. It's not like we know the people we're going to marry now. Like what about the whole rest of life? I could meet Jake Gyllenhaal sometime or whoever. My parents met when they were 16, Judy said. Yeah, and got an arranged marriage. Anita gave a little shiver of revulsion, one I'd seen before when she spoke about the parents of Hammond Creek, whose lives she roundly disdained. Anyway, it's not like I'm going to marry an Indian guy. Everything hung dead in the air for a moment. And then Juhi and Isha started to guffaw, looking around at me and Manu and Karthik and Aleem. The video game was forgotten. A soldier spun on screen, displaying his machine gun impotently. 
I mean, no offense, Anita said to the air. Yeah, well, it's not like I'm going to marry, Manu was saying, when in came Shruti Patel. The room stiffened at the sight of her, standing there in her wiry, frizzy manner. Her presence fractured a party. You were too aware of the sounds of her mouth breathing, the way her face contorted when she tried to participate. It required emotional labor to include her, and it was simpler to dispense with all the kindergarten rules of engagement and simply ignore her. That day, Shruti seemed to know more than ever these facts about herself. Those bushy eyebrows, which so often met in the middle of her forehead as she considered a problem in class, raised almost to her hairline and then flattened. She wanted us to believe she had never given us any thought at all, though behind her, Mrs. Putt was saying, see, Shruti, I told you all your classmates were hiding out down here, which was when Isha, I done Anita, said, guess who you're going to marry, Shroots? She and Juhi snickered. Manu's eyes met mine as we both considered intervening. But you had to save your ammo for yourself. The derision could land on you anytime. And even among friends, it had the effect of total destruction. It took so much to gather yourself up into some semblance of a person every morning. A rash of mocking could undo all that in an instant. I sat with my back against the wall and laughed as quietly as possible. Thank you so much for that terrific reading, Sanjana. And um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here with you um, talking about gold diggers. Um, I just want to say a couple of uh, words about the book. Um, I, I thought it was just fantastic. Uh, and I think the passage that Sanjana read uh, typifies a lot of its qualities, which is that the prose is extremely lively and surprising and really exquisitely wrought. Um, you know, just just excellent writing on a sentence by sentence level. Um, and also it's full of uh, real insight and sort of almost anthropological precision about Indians in Atlanta and Silicon Valley in India. Um, and, you know, again, you got a sense from this passage of the kind of humor that underlies this X-ray of a community that Sanjana is providing. And, and I, in an email to her, I said that it really reminded me in some ways of um, what the Jewish American authors were doing in, in the 60s when you think of someone like Cynthia Ozick or Saul Bellow or, or Philip Roth. So it was a real pleasure to read and I'm excited to, to talk to you about it. Um, one of the first questions I had actually is about the subject matter of, of the book itself, which is, you know, as I said, this kind of in my mind, a kind of x-ray of a, of a community. And you have this great line midway through the book where you say, when Neil, the narrator is saying, though we'd grown up in a no place, the privilege and ambition incubated in that no place had driven many of us to the place where so many with privilege and ambition flock. And she, he's talking about Silicon Valley. But I'm curious how you, as a, as a person from Atlanta, from the suburbs, were able to find a subject in what can seem like a no place as you're describing it. How long did that take and what was that process like? Yeah, well, thank you for saying all those nice things. Um, really means a lot. Um, I think it, it took however old I was when I started writing this 25 years um, to decide that this was worthwhile subject matter. Um, I think growing up, like the books I really loved, they, they weren't about the world that I came from. Um, uh, I mean, people would hand you like Jhumpa Lahiri and say, this is this is what you get. Um, and that was it. But, you know, I loved like Arundhati the Roy. I loved The God of Small Things. I loved um, these like big, great American novels, um, Gatsby and Catcher in the Rye and All the King's Men. And none of those appeared to be about my world. But um, I think in college, I started realizing that like, you're just stuck. It's not that like, write what you know, thing that everyone says isn't empowering, it's it's limiting, but I think it's like a helpful constriction. Um, I just realized that I had a point of view um, that I felt like an outsider in a lot of ways, but I was like, you know, Fitzgerald felt like an outsider as a Midwesterner on the East Coast and like all of the ways in which you can differentiate yourself from the milieu that you're in is an advantage. Um, and I started writing about the Atlanta suburbs kind of more, um, more explicitly when I realized that these were immigrant spaces, that I hadn't just been living in a white world, but I was living in kind of a subculture world. Um, you know, there's uh, this thing that I've been thinking about a lot because of the, the shootings in Atlanta, like 
strip malls in the suburbs of Atlanta are just really immigrant heavy. Like I think about this mm. one that I used to go to all the time with like a Kumon math center and my Bharatanatyam dance studio. And I like dreaded going to this Kumon math center. But I think about that now and like everything in that strip mall was owned and run by immigrants. And it's where we went to um, buy things, feel at home, congregate. Um, and so starting to see those no places as places that belonged to immigrants and children of immigrants, something shifted for me there. It's a great answer. Um, do you do you feel like there were models for you in Indian American writing or South Asian American or Asian American writing? Because um, it, it is a kind of canon that is still quite small in some ways. So I'm wondering, you know, you mentioned Jhumpa Lahiri, but were there other people? The, I mean, a lot of what I had to do was stop reading um, uh, writers who seemed like they could be too close to me in college. So um, like I, I read a lot of minority writers in college, but people who weren't Indian in part, cause I was like, I, I need to figure out what my experience looks like without this. So um, in college, I read Zadie Smith for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, White Teeth totally blew my mind as a junior in college. And then I ended up writing my thesis, um, reading White Teeth and NW, which had just come out at the time in conversation with one another about sort of like the public sphere in immigrant London. And uh, Zadie Smith has this essay called Speaking in Tongues that was originally a talk um, delivered right after Obama was elected about people who are multiplicitous. And she puts forth this thesis that like, if you're biracial, if you're a product of migration, you, um, you exist in a kind of bothness. And that bothness is like productive for art and it's also productive for idealism. Um, and so I think that's how I think about the writers who really spoke to me were people who kind of existed in that bothness. And, and you know, Rushdie is obviously like that too. Um, uh, the book that I think really helped get me going on this particular novel was when I finally read the book of suburbia in my mm -hmm. first year of grad school which I'm sure you have thoughts on um but I, I read that and I read English August um mm -hmm. these like kind of cult favorite um Indian novels that broke every rule for what I thought the Indian novel could be and I was like oh this is another way to sort of like do brown irreverence um I'm curious if you had that experience with either of those books as another kind of brown irreverent writer not not for those books but I certainly had that experience with with other writers but I'm I'm glad you brought up Hanif Qureshi because what I was thinking about while reading your book is that Indian or Indian American writers who said about writing about the US face a specific problem compared to um, British South Asian writers like Hanif Qureshi, which is that a, an, an Indian in Britain has a kind of very charged relationship to British history, right? Like it is, it is, it's not, I mean, you know, it has analogs to the black American experience here, which is like, you are deeply embedded in ways that are comfortable and generally super uncomfortable. The Indian writer here or the Indian American here has, a, has an ahistorical situation, which is that Indians, you know, yes, you, in your book, you get really smartly into the early waves of migrations in, in the 1800s, but really a lot of the people you're writing about come post 1965. They don't have a deeper connection. And I was really impressed with how you were able to actually turn the ahistorical um, nature of it into one of the themes of the book. There's this great line where, um, Again, Neil says, I would never have a corollary in the past. He's desperately searching for an analog in the American past. How did you figure out how to actually embed that lack as like an engine of the book? Like, how did that happen? I'm so curious about it. And like, you know, it's, it's, it's almost difficult for me to imagine this book without that kind of um, thought behind it. Yeah, yeah, the, the ahistoricity thing is really, it's super interesting and it's, it leads into like the class positioning of these these characters mm -hmm. too. We are like a highly socially engineered diaspora because of mm -hmm. the way visas arrive. But I think part of that was, so I, I moved to San Francisco um, a little after college um, and I was there uh, in 2014, 2015. And I discovered like, that was when I started learning that in California and on the West Coast, Asian American history actually really is American history. And it was the first time that I learned that 
you know, we talk about the contemporary Indian diaspora is forming after 1965, as you said, when like this ban on Asians was lifted. But I learned about this pre-1917 um, kind of waves of immigration. Um, and it was just a very different group of people who emigrated, um, more working class, um, uh, many were undocumented, um, mostly men, many of them passing um, for black or Puerto Rican. Um, I always recommend Vivek Bald and Vijay Prashad's work here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I became really interested in like that chunk of South Asian American history. Cause I was like, no one gave me this. And like, what does this say about sort of the, the artificial flattening of my understanding of my community? And so Neil, the narrator, as you say, becomes very consumed with history. He's, um, uh, he's a history PhD student in the second half for people who haven't read yet. And um, he encounters the story of um, someone called the Bombay and gold digger who uh, appears to be an Indian man in the gold rush. Um, and that doesn't line up with any of our understandings of, of gold rush history. Like it's a phenomenon that was like Californians, Chinese people, Australians, New Zealand, but like no Indians. And um, I, I found a story kind of in, while I, I had started writing the book, I already had this sort of conceit at its heart that's like these people were gonna be stealing gold in the Atlanta suburbs. And then I started going backward and saying, I wanna involve some of the history that I've learned about, how, how can I involve it? And the most obvious thing to do was look at the gold rush. Um, but I spent a couple months reading and finding no Indian in the gold rush. Um, and sort of just when I was about to give up, I, I found this travelogue uploaded to the Library of Congress's archive that told the story of, it was just the last vignette in this little travelogue and it was called The Hindu. And it was about this man who this German gold rush migrant identified as being from Bombay. Um, and it was a story about how a bunch of white people came across this man and um, basically like formed a vigilante justice squad and kind of tried to lynch him after accusing him of stealing gold. And I became really obsessed with this story because I was like, this is, this is proof that we were here earlier. Um, and as I went about trying to get more corroboration of this figure, I just couldn't. Um, and maybe I'm just a bad historian, but like I emailed historians, I did a lot of reading and I just could not find this man. So instead of I thought about kind of making it like a 60 page chunk of just pure history in the middle, like the this chunk in All the King's Men. Um, but instead of kind of fully making it up, I thought, you know, that would be one way to sort of imagine that we've been here all along, but the truth of the Indian American experience and the Asian American experience has been like existing in the margins. And so maybe it would be more interesting um, for my narrator to be similarly sort of have to throw up his hands and say, I can't find this person either. Um, it also meant I didn't have to write a 60 page history <laughs> in the middle, which was probably easier. Uh, you know, and one of the bolder decisions in the book, which, which really worked for me is what, is what you described, where there's a kind of leap in the middle. So the people in the audience heard what the first half of the book is like, which is um, in some ways like two teenagers whose lives are entwined in the suburbs coming of age. And then it shifts to um, 10 years later, 15 years later, where Neil is like a sort of stoner, uh, druggy, you know, PhD burnout at Berkeley. And like his love interest is, has sort of burning out of like her Silicon Valley job. That leap reminded me in many ways of Fortress of Solitude by Jonathan Lethem. And I'm just curious, like, I'm always curious in the process of writing, how late did that come? Or was that architecture already there from the beginning of the book when you, I, you said you came to it at some point, but I mean, I'm curious when and how. Yeah, yeah, a couple of people have made that comparison, which is funny. Um, uh, I don't know, I've always liked books that contain a sense of time in them. And mm -hmm. for a long time, I thought the way to do that was writing like a multi-generational family saga. And that wasn't really happening. Um, uh, probably for good reason, I like haven't lived enough to do a great job of that. Um, but I think one thing that we don't see that much of is like this, I don't know, this like treatment of young adulthood and like the, that particular decade. Um, and I also like, I knew I didn't wanna live in teenagers heads forever. So the, the thing that I think helped me make that decision was, um, you know, there's a phrase that we talk about in writing workshops, this idea of the point of telling. And so I had started writing um, the first half and then 
um, was thinking about my, thinking to myself, you know, what is the point of telling? And, and for, for people who haven't lived their lives in um, creative writing workshop, the point of telling refers to this idea where exactly is the narrator sitting in relation to the events of the story? And so what kind of insights does the narrator have when they're telling a story about age 15? You tell a story about age 15 differently at 23, at 28, at 50, whatever. And so I started telling the, the teenager story actually from Anita's perspective um, at first. And then I just started vomit drafting my way through this world, kind of discovered Neil's voice. And I was like, oh, this is the voice of a 20 something man. Um, and then of course I had to write the part I already knew about the teenage years. And then I just had to catch up to him um, where he was sitting later. Um, and it's nice, it's a nice little way to do a character who's like both wise and unwise um, is just creating that narrative distance and then trying to figure out so much of the character work is what you do in between. Um, what happened to them? What do they know about it? What do they not know about it? I just think that's like a wonderful narrative dance to try out. Mm -hmm. Do you, And the magic realist elements, right? So there's, of course, one big part of the book is, is uh, I wouldn't give away too much, but like this kind of gold portion that that makes people more ambitious and focused. It's almost like a study drug, which you make a comparison to later. You compare, you sort of, Neil later on gets into, you know, Adderall and Ritalin. Um, the, the magic realist elements of the book, like did you have any hesitation about putting that into what is otherwise a realist novel or was it there from the beginning? Um, you know, how did you, as, as drafting and writing went on, how did that element come into being? Yeah, it actually started with that. I think um, on the other side of this book, um, I have been told, and I probably now agree with this asses assessment that I am a primarily realist writer. But at the time of writing this, I was writing almost exclusively speculative fiction, hmm. um, uh, which you know just is like non non realist fiction. And I had started doing that in part because my realism had gotten really somber and really bad and really boring. And um, I wasn't like, I wasn't a very funny writer until I started messing about with speculative fiction. I had written a few realist stories that had kind of like a George Saunders-y voice. And I was like, oh, I like what my brain does when it's playful. But speculative fiction actually gave me a way to constantly feel playful. Because again, it's like you, you take the known world, you adjust one variable, and then you write to fill in that gap. Like what, is, what happens when you change one variable? And so I started with this device, this idea that people were gonna steal gold and they were gonna drink it. And then I had to make it fit um, into this landscape. And so I kind of wrote my way into the world. I think the other thing that's interesting is like I, I'd never felt fully comfortable inhabiting like character driven fiction until I decided to write a novel. Like I think short stories, even really good, rich psychologically realist short stories, like they're always a little about concept, I think. And so, this was a way like going putting the magical realist device into a novel i ended up having to write a lot of realism in order to create the emotional landscape um and find that balance but yeah it is it is basically a socially realist novel that is much closer to like roth than it is to murakami but there's murakami in there too well it's really interesting you say that because it does seem like sometimes when you are trying to break through to the reality of a situation, especially one that's not been written before. You know, you do this very funny thing in the novel too, where you're like, at one point, Neil is making fun of like the English teacher for assigning these very somber immigrant stories. And like, we learn that old people looking out of windows symbolize nostalgia for their former nations. And there's there's something about that, which is which rings true. Like there's a lot of, dare I say, boring, somber immigrant fiction, including written by our own people. Um, and uh, I'm not going to name any names, but that there it is. And it seems like you were, by able to sort of look at something else, the truth was able to pour out much more easily. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 this is now a, a side question related to this. Um, and I think in a, after a couple of questions, we'll move on to the audience. But when you had read, I, I'm always interested in what drives a person to write. And for me, sometimes it is like, you're reading a bunch of books and you're like, this doesn't capture it at all. Like, this is not what it feels like to be, here in this time as this person for you what was it like what did you what when you read like this huge corpus whatever it was whether it's Zadie Smith whether it's Chumpa Lahiri whether it's Indian writers did you feel were you like uh they aren't getting something I need to I need to communicate this and what was that yeah um I think I joked to a friend of mine 
at one point I was like, if I'm, if I were white, I would probably be a lawyer by now. Um, so for me, like being somehow outsider was probably core to writing, but I, I actually don't think that's true. I think it starts way earlier before you have any like consciousness of race. Um, I started wanting to write because I was a reader first. Um, mm -hmm. I used to love Enid Blyton's boarding school books and just escape into those and, you know, like the famous five and all those detective stories. Um, and I think I liked reading and writing because it acknowledged this thing that I suspected was true as a kid that like people weren't saying everything in real life that was happening in real life. Like I just had this suspicion that everyone had other stuff going on and, and they couldn't bring it into daily reality. Um, and so, you know, Matt, like novels with magic in them literalize that, but I think that's like the suspicion on which most fiction is founded. This idea that like there is a private life, there is human subjectivity, and we don't have access to it in day-to-day -day reality. And so fiction tries to make us more intimate, um, give us that more intimate space. And so I think I had that suspicion from a really young age. Um, but then in high school, I remember reading this mix of like Indian fiction and American fiction and being like, I like both of these. I'm not <laughs> quite either of them, surely there's stuff to do in between. Um, yeah, I think, and I, I hate I hate the language of, of mere representation because it is so much more than that, but I think there was like a gap um, in what I felt was was just like a recording of human experience that I, I, I thought, yeah, we could fill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, just a reminder to the audience that so you, you can uh, click the Q&A button to ask questions. So I will get to you guys in a minute. So, since you mentioned reporting, Sanchara, I know you you have a background as a reporter, and I was really struck by the section uh, set in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, I lived there. I went. I went to college there. I know the area well, and um, I, I thought you did a, a wonderful job just capturing that landscape. And um, you know, I, I'm going to read like a here's the description that you had. Um, you talk about like how the earth's like tones of the buildings blended into the landscape as though to normalize Silicon Valley wealth. But I know that you lived there as a journalist. This is not like deep seated memories from childhood, for example, being transmuted into fiction. So was there a process of research that went into the Silicon Valley sections or were you again operating off instinct? Yeah, the Silicon Valley sections were mostly instinct, but it was, again, I think it had taken like a decade to realize that the suburbs were worth writing about. And it took mm -hmm. another few years to realize that Silicon Valley was worth writing about because it it's so ugly. Like right. it's, it doesn't seem like this stuff of literature. It's like ripe for satire, like the amazing HBO show, but it doesn't feel like the thing that you write literary fiction about. So those were pretty hard won sections. It took me a long time to get there. I think what being a reporter forced me to do is I I would not have wanted to cover tech if I had my choice of being mm -hmm. as a reporter, but I sort of got like dragooned into covering tech. And because of that, I just learned a lot about worlds that I never would have opted into. And that's really useful. Um, it's like, I had been forced into doing this research like five years before I actually started writing the book and just learned that, you know, there are people who are starting companies who think they can live forever. And like they, like literally 1000 years, Aubrey de Grey, like I talked to absolutely crazy people. I would just go to a meeting and someone would be refusing to get off their treadmill standing desk to, to speak to me. It just like, it helps you develop this like particular eye for um, sort of comic details, but they're just, they're just reality in, in the Valley. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I read in an interview that you know you some of the some of the research it sounds like you're you're a good listener and you actually um go and talk to people who have been embedded in a particular context so i, I there's a great section in the book where there's an uh, an aol instant messenger co conversation and um i learned from another interview that sanjana did that she actually looked at one of her friends allowed her to look at his aim messages from his childhood right or gchat messages and that you know you have this wonderful section set in um, IIT, the engineering university in India. And again, you were not even probably born then, and that's really well done. So, what is that? What is that? That kind of process of research? Can you describe it? Like, and how you know how collaborative is it? Yeah. Um, well, the the 
teenage sections, I just had to remember what we talked about. Cause I was like, I feel like we said mm-hmm. a whole lot of nothing. Mm-hmm. I think we said a lot of problematic things that I like don't really want to re-enact it. But, but you enacted, reenacted well. There's, I won't say the line, but you know, there's, there's a few pieces of dialogue where I was like, this is politically incorrect in the right way. Like this is what kids say when they're like 12, you know, they don't say the right thing. Totally. Um, yeah. I mean, but I had to remember that. So that was kind of just like chatting with, with, old friends and reading the the IMs. Um, for the IIT sections, I talked to my uncle um, who went to IIT Bombay and uh, also my aunt who's like Maharashtra and grew up in Bombay. Um, I talked to her a little bit as well for the section set in Dadar, which is like a middle-class neighborhood in Bombay. Um, and I've lived there, but but not in, in that context. Um, and the thing that I loved about talking to my uncle about this, I called him and was like, I want to know how I could have like a meet cute between these two characters who will eventually emigrate to the US. And here's what I know about her. Like people call her a gold digger. Here's what I know about him. He's sort of cold and unfeeling, but like, how could I get these two people together? And so I thought I was calling him just to talk about, you know, like logistics and information, but instead I got to hear him like reflect for kind of a long period, several hours about the things that he had loved about um, being on this campus and what I had thought of as sort of a serious engineering institute, it turned out it was like this majority male group of people who were sort of like dicking around the same way that we were dicking around in the suburbs in Atlanta. Um, and so I got, I got the emotional relationship that he had with it. And I just got to steal that. And that is something that you don't get to do in journalism. You don't get to like, you don't get to inhabit someone else's, um, you know, private and emotional experiences that way. So that was a cool way to do journalism without doing journalism. Okay, last quick question for me and then we're gonna move on, uh, which is, I know you come from a family uh, of translators, like your, it sounds like your grandmother and your great grandmother are translators from Malayali. What is what has that been like being, being from a family of writers? You know, do you, is that like multi-generational critiquing sessions of your work? No, no, definitely not. I. Um, I got to meet my, my great grandmother um, when I was young. Um, uh, she passed away about 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Um, but I, I grew up with this sort of like mythological understanding that she had translated Jane Eyre into Malayalam, despite having been, been like married off really young. Mm-hmm. And um, I just, I think that that was like freeing in this like conceptual way. It wasn't like bringing to the table all the time. Um, and then my um, my grandmother, her daughter, is like a Sahitya Academy award-winning translator. And I remember, which for people who don't know, India, that's like the Pulitzers. And I remember going to her award ceremony when I was eight and having no idea what this was, but later realizing like, wow, this is a relationship that um, women in my family have had to literature for a long time. My grandmother is also a really nice writer and she's, she published one story, but not that many. And I, I think... Um, she, you know, she told me when, when I told her I had the book coming out, she was like, I I would have liked to do more. Um, so that it's been cool to feel like I'm in communion with that. Um, it officially skipped a generation, but, um, my, my dad did, um, personally like, uh, go up to Salman Rushdie at a reading and be like, my daughter has a book coming out here. I'll make you write it down. So there's, there's some love for books that got passed down. That's really funny. Um, okay, so some of the questions from uh, the audience. Uh, one is from Anjali who asks, what parts of the book are you most excited to witness being adapted for the screen? And I know Mindy Kaling is, is making a TV show out of it. And you're going to be a writer on it perhaps too? Yeah, I'll be co-writing the adaptation. Um, yeah, it's super exciting. We're really, really early on. So I don't actually have that much that I can say about it yet because we're just now interviewing showrunners. I think one thing that's cool is when when my agent told me we were going to go out to you know people in Hollywood with it, my first thought was like, you can't cast this because there are like not that many white people and who would watch this? Um, I got like a wonderful piece of hate mail the other day that was like, anyone who wasn't Asian or Indian didn't even deserve a name in this book. Um, Good which, job. <laughs> like really not intentional, right? I like I wasn't I wasn't trying to do, do that, but I was like there's no way that could fly on television. Um, And that will be cool if we are allowed to do it. It will be 
like the story of a community from the inside and not necessarily from the outside. And I think so much of like the politics of representation on television have been about like, can we show how this community assimilates into white America? And like this book is more interested in what happens inside a community as the community assimilates and like what happens as we amass power like socially and economically. And like, those are just like more intimate stories that I like, it would be really cool to see those on screen. Uh, William asks if gold has played an important role in your life or your family specifically, like whether there was a personal connection to gold that made it such a through line. Um, I mean, anyone who's grown up in an Indian household just knows there's like gold around. It's just kind of an object that, exists everywhere. Um, so I just remembered it being a part of my life. Like my ears were pierced when I was six months old and I had little gold hoops in there. And when I was a preteen, I remember, you know, all the white girls in my class being like, I'm not allowed to have pierced ears. Um, and there was this like gulf of this thing seems to be part of our lives in a way that it's not part of everyone else's. The actual gold inspiration for this though came from like a, a real life series of gold thefts that happened in the suburbs of Atlanta and in suburbs all around the US. And I remember um, just being like my mom suggested that maybe uh, Indians were involved because these thieves like knew where to go in the house. And so I had just been sitting on that for a while and was like, what would it be like um, to write those gold thieves and to write someone who sort of was in the community but also had a reason to violate the community's trust. Um, yeah. Uh, an anonymous attendee uh, <laughs> asks um, if there were, it's kind of an interesting question, whether there were any particular stylistic things that are like sort of more associated with quote unquote American literature that you have learned to ignore or reject. Mm -hmm. And I guess the corollary would be like whether you are whether there were stylistic inspirations from other cultures and the kind of literature they produced that was helpful in kind of birthing this novel? That's such an interesting question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like one of the orthodoxies of um, like American realism is this like show don't tell thing that you learn um, from like third grade if you're ever taught writing, um, but I mean, this, the, the simplistic change I've made is like, you have to show and tell. But I, I, think, I think the sort of like dominant mode of like, oh, we're all doing psychological realism. Here's what a perfect New Yorker short story looks like. And it culminates in a nice little private epiphany at the end. Um, if I rejected that, it's just because they couldn't really do it. Like it, it doesn't really work when I do it. Um, but I started reading a lot of Japanese literature um, about five or six years ago in part because I felt like like if there's an aesthetic tradition that is like complete into itself and has not been forced into a dialogue with the west because of colonization it's like potentially Jap like Japanese literature is one of those um, and also because I was really interested in like Buddhism and how that inflected narrative and there's like a sort of like interesting opacity that you see in Japanese literature that um, I, I sort of like borrowed for a while and again that doesn't fully work for me but this idea that like you know you can have like ghosts moving in and out of um you know a, a book like banana yoshimoto's kitchen um and that's just treated as part of realism it's not segregated um and then i think the sort of like hysterical realism of um rushdi and zadie smith and to some degree hana Qureshi, like i think like the the English novel, um, but like the English English immigrant novel has also been really helpful um, as as you were kind of saying, it's like a different historical relationship to um, whiteness that surrounds you. So that's also been useful. Yeah, and, and you did, you know, the show not uh, show don't tell thing is is interesting because yeah, one of the strengths of the book for me was that yeah, you're able to because you make Neil into a writer essentially or a historian, he's able to just tell us about history in a way that I'm not sure how you would have built a scaffold to communicate that without a character like that. And this sort of connects to a question by someone named Neil who has a question about Neil, uh, <laughs> which is that your path appears to be more like Anita's. If so, do you wish it were more like Neil's? How does the character of Neil fit into who you are? Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been funny. Um, 
most people have assumed like, okay, here's a really intense um, <laughs> Indian girl at this, like in the book, it, it surely is you. Um, <laughs> I, I, I pass for an Anita on the outside, but on the inside, I, like most writers, am much more like Neil. Um, he, he, has, he has a private life. I started writing from Anita's perspective because it seemed like the obvious way to write, and she doesn't have an inner life. That's her whole thing. She's so, so ambitious that there's nothing going on in terms of introspection or privacy or loneliness. Um, and all of that comes for her later in her 20s. Um, and so I gave a little bit of myself to her as you give a little bit of yourself to every single character in fiction. Um, but um, Neil, I think Neil was my, I don't know, like transparent eyeball. He was, he was the, the way I was able to move through this world. Um, it was also really interesting to hear from a cousin of mine who um, is a young woman, she's in high school, and she was like, I thought I would relate to Anita. And it, it turns out like I have, I have a lot of like Neil in me too. Um, and I think that Neil is like a more common character in the South Asian diaspora than people um, maybe have realized. Like there are a lot of us who have this sort of like bumbling underachieving um, semi slacker stoner tendency that it's not all <laughs> just the highly intense Anitas. Mm -hmm. Uh, Wendy asks, what was your favorite book growing up? I think you've answered this kind of, but if you, if you can alight on an actual favorite. Um, I, I mean, I, I, it's so cliche, but I did read The Great Gatsby like 10 or 15 times in high school. Um, and that's just so in me. Um, I reread The Bell Jar a lot and I reread, um, All the King's Men. Um, these days, a lot of my like adult favorite books are not quite the same as the ones in, in childhood. Yeah. I did find it interesting. Yeah, I did kind of see a slightly Gatby-esque um, vibe here where like you, you have, as you said, Neil as the transparent eyeball looking at the very ambitious, almost like crazily ambitious character and trying to make sense of her, right? Um, so and, and, uh, I, I think we've more or less covered most of the, uh, the questions in the Q&A, so I'll just ask you one or two more before we go, which is, you know, I was thinking about other contemporary American novels too, and, you know, just what it's like to be uh, writing right now. You know, you have this, a lot of the book is actually about debate as well, right? There's this interesting transition that goes from Neil is a good debater, and then he becomes a historian, and he reflects on what the difference is. And of course, there was a great debate novel that came out recently, Ben Lerner's book, The Topeka School, so I'm wondering how it, what, what, what that feels like when like a really microcosmic but private world is also explored in someone else's fiction. Like what, what, what did you think of that book and how did it, did it affect your book in any way? Oh, I was so mad. Um, <laughs> I've, I, I was writing um, an essay about debate that I've been trying to publish. That's like one of the most important things I've written to me personally. Um, and now everyone's like, well, I read the Topeka School. Um, but no, it's an amazing book. I love Ben Lerner. Um, I think one thing that's really interesting about the discourse around debate, if that's like not too meta, is people are trying to understand like how argument functions in mm -hmm. a moment when like it, argument itself seems to sometimes be immoral. Um, and that's something that like, to me, this book contains like 5% of the things I have to say about high school debate argumentation period but it starts to infuse Neil later in the book I think I did like one final edit that felt to me like it was like a morality revision where I was like this book has a moral relationship to ambition and greed but it like I need to do kind of one more read through and like fully feel that as um, like sort of a few steps removed. And I found myself, that's when I found myself thinking a lot about debate and how it would transition to Neil's work as a historian is like, is there a sort of like value neutral way to like wield knowledge? Um, what did Neil learn how to do as a teenager, as a debater who could like talk his way out of a lot of different things? How does that change when he starts like studying history and having um, in, a, in a moment of, you know, in 2016, um, and so the book obviously doesn't attempt to answer that at all, but it was something that I was interested in. Yeah, yeah, it's a great book. <laughs> and yeah, the debate stuff was very different. I was just kind of struck by, yeah, how, 
how infrequently one reads novels about debate. And now I've suddenly read two of them. <laughs> um, we have a question from Anjali, which is, um, as someone who was raised by a relatively progressive single mother in Kerala, who was raised in Kerala, I was intrigued by Anita and Anjali's dynamic. It's funny, all the people who are asking questions have the same names as your characters. It seems like a setup. And Anjali and Pranesha's separation. When planning the story arc, did you particularly reflect on how mothers play a role in developing a teen's varying levels of ambition? Oh, wow. That's wonderful. Um, thank you for sharing, Anjali. Um, uh, a friend of mine um, who reads a lot of my work read the first chapter and was like, there's a lot of stuff about moms in here. Like, is this Portnoy? Like, what is, what is this? Um, I was, I, I thought about it when a reporter was asking me about, like, it's a novel told by a man, but it is so much about women. And I think the reason partly is just that, like, it's so often women who carry on, like, burdens of tradition in the diaspora. Um, and so I can't speak to, like, growing up in Kerala, but I think per, like anytime migration happens, like even when you have progressive people, like it's so often women who are maintaining language traditions, like traditions of the arts, um, culinary stuff, like even in my like relatively progressive community, um, you know, like I was, I was taken to Indian dance classes and my brother didn't do an Indian thing. And so there's just this, like, it seems to pass matrilineally. Um, uh, and so I, I, I think that's sort of how it's, it's cultivated in the book is you have Anjali who is sort of denied her own ambitious space by her mother back in Bombay because she's a girl. She has brothers who will go to IIT, but she's not told that she's going to go to IIT. And then she brings like unfulfilled ambition to the diaspora and kind of channels it all into her daughter. So I think in that sense, it's also like a generational thing of like, not every woman like my parents age had the opportunity to fulfill all of their professional ambitions. I grew up with a mom who, who was working and, and is working and really did get a lot of um, professional space. But I feel like I saw in my community lots of moms who were like, they, they maybe hadn't even been able to work when they got here because they were here on a husband's visa. And so what happens to unfulfilled ambition? It goes somewhere and that's more complicated to me than like tiger momming, um, but it can manifest as something that passes for tiger momming. <laughs> Great, so one, one last question for you and then we'll let you go and let everyone go. Um, thank you for really wonderful answers so far. Uh, you mentioned tiger momming and you do this nice thing in the book and I, you brought this up in another interview, which is that, you know, you, you're, you're kind of unsparing about people of your generation do. You're like, it's not just the tiger moms uh, that this, which is the stereotype. We've imbibed it and we put pressure on each other to be these hyper achievers. Um, and the book is full of these sort of excellent, uncomfortably truthful observations about the Indian American community. And I'm always curious, I know the book has just come out, what the response has been among Indian American readers. Like what, what have you heard from people so far? Um, and, are, and is anyone uncomfortable or like unhappy, which is also pretty funny if that happens? I'm, I'm sure people are. I haven't heard from them yet. Um, I expect I will. Um, <laughs> so far, I've been getting a lot of texts that are like, I feel seen, I feel seen, which is really rewarding and, mm -hmm. and nice. I mean, one thing that's interesting is I'm, I'm kind of trying to figure out if people are just pleased to see themselves or like if the story's kind of values get metabolized in any way. Um, like it's hard to know because not everyone is like super eloquent about a book that they love. But I mean, I think I wrote this, this book with, you know, affection for my community, but also kind of a lot of anger about the values that we seem to take for granted. Like it's, it really is like a critique of upward mobility um, and about how it can make us too comfortable and complacent and therefore conservative. And so I don't, I don't quite know if people who are feeling seen by the book are also thinking about like complacency and risks of conservatism. And I hope they are, but to me, it's also just like, it's a reminder that fiction is entertainment and escapism and like um, it, the, the sort of political underlying stuff you're carrying might, might you don't know if it'll land. Um, 
uh, but it's also been interesting to like be in Atlanta um, and see Atlanta Macy's um, when uh, the book is about these worlds. Um, and I think one thing that I've also noticed has been like a little bit of a distance in reflection. Like people aren't in exactly the same place that they were in the 90s and 2000s. So there is space to say, maybe we looked like this in the 90s and 2000s. What, what do we look like now? There's freedom, we've arrived. Maybe we can um, innovate our, our values a little differently. So maybe there's just space and it's not as painful as I thought it would be. That sounds like classic denial by those readers. <laughs> But yeah, no, that's good. Um, no, that's not, that's that sounds. I mean, I think it's possible for people to have all those reactions, right? To be entertained, to be seen, to feel uncomfortable, and I think the best parts of the book do that. So, congratulations again. Thank you. Uh, good luck with the rest of the book tour, and um, thank you all for coming and for the great questions. I'm going to hand it over to Audrey now. Thank you again, both for being here. This is such a wonderful talk and such a wonderful book. I'm really, really glad we were able to host you both. Um, there is one more question I think is very important. <laughs> Sanjana, where did you get your earrings? Oh, these are a friend bought them for me in Bombay. I have no idea where. <laughs> All my good, good friends. friends. She stole she stole them. That's what the book is about. <laughs> That's it was a confession. It's a it's a confession of theft. We have it on camera now. Anyway. Um, well, thank you again, both, for coming and giving this beautiful talk. And thank you to everyone at home who is tuning in tonight in support of our authors, publishers, our booksellers, and the incredible staff at Harvard Bookstore. If you would like to uh, support Harvard Bookstore and Sanjana, check out the link in the chat where you can purchase a copy. Please, please do. Um, please remember to shop indie, shop local from all of us at Harvard Bookstore. Stay safe, be well, and have a great rest of your night. Take care, everybody. Bye.